Hi, everyone. Um, welcome and good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Seth Lewis, and on behalf of the Harvard University Division of Science, the Harvard Library, and the Harvard Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment in our Science Book Talk lecture series. I'm thrilled to announce this virtual event with Camilla Nord, who's presenting her new book, The Balanced Brain, The Science of Mental Health. Before we move forward, there are a few housekeeping things to bring to your attention. We have two events next month. March 19th, Nicholas Money presents Molds, Mushrooms, and Medicines, Our Lifelong Relationship with Fungi. And on March 28th, Paul Halpern, in conversation with Jacob Berendis, presents The Allure of the Multiverse, Extra Dimensions, Other Worlds, and Parallel Universes. For more information and to stay up to date on all things Harvard Science Book Talks, Make sure to subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter, and check out our YouTube channel for the latest videos. Um, once tonight's talk begins, I'll place a link in the chat to purchase the balanced brain from the store. Um, you know, once our speaker is concluded tonight, um, we will have some time for some Q and A. Um, if at any point throughout the the conversation um, you have any questions, please click on please click on the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll get through as many as possible. Lastly, thank you to our partners at the bookstore, and thank you for all showing up tonight in support of authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and science. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Camilla Nord leads the Mental Health Neuroscience Lab at the University of Cambridge. Her research has been featured in the New Statesman, the Daily Mail, the British Journal of Psychiatry, and on the BBC. This evening, she'll be discussing The Balanced Brain, a book Publishers Weekly calls a superior volume on the biological underpinnings of mental health. In The Balanced Brain, Nord reframes mental health as an intricate self-regulating process, one which is different for all of us. She examines a huge diversity of treatments from therapy and medication to recreational drugs and electrical brain stimulation to show how they work and why sometimes they don't. In doing so, she reveals how the small things we do lift our mood during the course of the day. A piece of chocolate, a coffee, chatting to a friend, often work on the same pathways in our brain as the latest pharmacological treatments for mental health disorders. Whether they help us to manage pain, learn from experience, or expend energy on things that are important for our survival, these conscious actions are part of a complex process that is unique to each individual and the constant backdrop to our everyday lives. Nord shows that with so many factors at play, there are more possibilities for recovery and resilience than we might think. Whether you're suffering or simply doing your best to stay afloat, this book is an invitation to discover what makes each of us feel better and why. We have a lot to learn this evening, and so without further ado, I'm delighted to think I'm delighted to turn things over to our speaker. The digital podium is hers. Hi everyone, and, and thank you so much for coming to hear me today. I'm speaking to you from the other Cambridge, on the other side of the pond, and even though we're quite far apart geographically, I can tell you right now we have something in common, which is just how important mental health is to all of our lives, not just in our sort of subjective sense of how things are going, although that matters too, but actually in that everybody has either they themselves or someone close to them experienced a mental health condition. In fact, mental health conditions are the world's leading cause of disability. So understanding where they come from, how we should treat them, how we could treat them better than we do today is of vital importance. And yet, I think we get led astray by a few things. So one way in which I think the debate, the understanding about mental health gets distracted is on this idea that there is either a psychological or a biological explanation. Even in thinking about my book, it's sort of, oh, well, it's a biological, it's the biological causes of mental health. In fact, I would argue every cause of mental health is a biological cause eventually. And I'll use an example of smoking to, to use this kind of possibly something quite well understood example. But in, in the case of smoking, this is an environmental trigger that we now well understand can be an important cause of something like lung cancer. But when we think about lung cancer, the mechanisms driving lung cancer, at the level of cancer itself, smoking is a very far away cause, a distal cause whilst things happening in the lungs and in the rest of the body, 
those are proximal causes. So in my opinion, the brain and the wider nervous system are the proximal cause of all mental health problems. So that's why I think we need to unwind that boundary a little bit. And then the second reason I've written this book is that I think we also get stuck in this artificial division between mental health and physical health. This even happens just in your own experience of symptoms, in all of our experiences. We might experience them in our body, we might experience something in the mind, and this dictates who you go to treat them and whether you ascribe them to particular causes or other causes. And I think this is actually very unhelpful, maybe even harmful, because sometimes the cause and in fact the best treatment of a mental health symptom might be something physical, something in the peripheral body. And sometimes the cause and the best treatment for a symptom we experience physically, something like chronic pain, might be treatments we ascribe more commonly to mental health domains. So for that reason, I also think physical and mental health as these kind of separable areas, we need to untangle that a little bit better and actually really deal with the nebulous area in between the two. And then the very final thing, and it's going to sound like a downer, but I promise that it's not, is that I don't think there's a silver bullet for mental health conditions. And in fact, I don't think there ever will be one. This isn't to say that I don't think there are really effective treatments that we have today that we could perhaps make better use of with some of the messages I'll tell you about today and that we'll invent, invent this year, next year, in 10 years, in 20 years. But I don't think any of those treatments will in and of themselves be a silver bullet for an entire condition, an entire diagnosis. And the reason for that is that diagnoses, the way we think about them in mental health, are, well, in some senses, they're cultural phenomena. They arise because of biological phenomena, but they're not in and of themselves a biological phenomenon. And I don't mean this as a criticism of mental health. In fact, across medicine, this is something that we've seen. Things that in the past might have been treated as, as, a, as a cough disorder, we now have a better understanding of the pathophysiology driving those very symptoms, which might, between two people, be quite different. And so in the case of mental health, I think we need to figure out the pathophysiology leading to groups of mental health symptoms that might or might not correspond with our current diagnostic categories. And that's why I think the silver bullet idea is a false friend here. So I'll begin with one of my favorite routes into mental health because I think it's very intuitive. No matter who conceptualizes mental health, if you ask an economist, it might be about sort of general life satisfaction. If you ask an, an animal scientist, they might tell you some behavior that that animal exhibits. But no matter who you ask, they might eventually draw on the idea of pleasure to tell you about someone's experience of mental health. Even clinically, the experience of a condition like major depression, one of the core criteria is an absence of the feeling of pleasure or the expectation of pleasure, the drive to experience pleasure. This is called anhedonia. And along with mood, it's one of the two main symptoms. In fact, you can have depression without chronic low mood if you have this core anhedonia symptom. So it's very, very important to our mental health that we're able to experience pleasure. But the way the brain generates pleasure is maybe a little bit surprising. We have this fascinating network of regions involved in pleasure, though not all causally involved. What I mean is that many of them are correlated with the experience of pleasure, but far fewer, what some scientists have called scattered islands, are actually causing pleasure. And these so-called hedonic hotspots scattered like volcanoes across our brain are our own individual maps of what evokes pleasure in ourselves. And we have the same sort of mapping for cold spots, things that we find disgusting, highly displeasurable. 
So this already gives you a sense of just how individualized, even quite seemingly obvious sources of happiness of mental health might be. But in fact, this kind of network becomes, I suppose, a sort of framework for how we might think about the emergence of mental health itself. Mental health is not as simple as a one or a zero, whether you're experiencing pleasure or not. It originates over time, over an accumulation of numerous experiences, which in all of our lives are positive and negative, pleasurable, displeasurable, something in between, something interesting, but not necessarily fun. All of these shape our experience of the world, most importantly, our predictions of the world around us. This is what I call the balanced brain and is the sort of central thesis, if you will, of my book. The idea that just like our body maintaining homeostasis in the face of very many challenges, challenges to our temperature, challenges to our survival, our brain is maintaining a sort of homeostasis by taking into account all the various things that it's experienced in the past, weighting them to different degrees, and predicting what will happen next in our emotional world. Will the outcomes of a social interaction be positive or negative? What about something risky, something we haven't tried before? What will happen as a result of that? What is our overall sense of our life? These are quite grand questions. They feel ephemeral but they're quantifiable, measurable through the lens of neuroscience and related sciences. And I, I hope at its very core, that's the impression that you get from my book. So in my opinion, the only way we can drive forward as a field and as a culture in understanding and treating mental health is to go beyond the subjective experience beyond the idea that someone is feeling happier, more anxious, or you know, many, many other mental health symptoms, and understand what's happening to drive those symptoms, what is causing those symptoms. And to illustrate that, I'm going to give you three examples of where I think mental health comes from. And I think all three of these are for different reasons, perhaps neglected in popular conceptualizations. Some of them might be even somewhat maligned, but I think all three are necessary to understand these driving forces in our brain, and as I'll say, also our body in generating our own subjective sense of mental health. These three mechanisms are our brain's learning processes, which are subserved by many, many different functions and regions and neurotransmitters, but I'll focus in particular on the neurotransmitter dopamine. Second, how these learning processes generate expectations, expectations which we then use to experience and influence the world around us and the world inside of us in our bodies. And then finally, the crucial role of our bodies our immune systems, our guts, even organs that you might not hear so much about, like our heart and our lungs, in engendering our sense of self and also our sense of our mental health. So to begin, I think that people understand intuitively why learning might affect mental health. But what they might not know is that every individual moment Every experience from a kind of experience to experience basis, we can quantify how someone's feeling and map that very neatly onto particular functions in the brain. So the example that I give sometimes here is a really beautiful set of experiments that started in the late 1990s, where neuroscientists were recording from deep inside the brain where a specific population of dopamine cells live. And these cells do something quite fascinating. When scientists delivered, it was monkeys in this experiment, something intensely pleasurable, a little drop of juice, monkeys like us love juice, these dopamine cells began to fire. Thus began what probably has really gotten away from the original science, this idea of dopamine as being a pleasure response. But that's actually not true. 
That's something I call a little bit of neurobolics in my book. Dopamine is not a pleasure response because the most exciting thing that happened was that once the monkeys were able to predict that the juice was coming, which the scientists cleverly did by pairing it with a flash of light. So it was like light juice, light juice, light juice. Once the monkeys expected the juice, the dopamine cells were no longer firing at the delivery of the juice. Instead, they shifted their firing earlier. They fired at the light, at the anticipation of juice. And when sometimes the mean scientists didn't give juice after the flash of light, they suppressed their firing below base rate. So what dopamine cells were doing in this context wasn't just responding to something nice, it was actually learning, learning to predict a surprisingly good outcome. And when it was no longer surprising, they were anticipating the outcome. So this tells us something absolutely fascinating about individual cells in our brain learning what to expect based on what's happened previously. And a few years later, a scientist called Rob Rutledge took this original science experiment that had been done in monkeys and transferred it to the human domain, which has a really key advantage because you can ask people how they're feeling. You can't do that with monkeys. And he did that. He asked people how they were feeling every few seconds after people had received either a surprising or less surprising amount of money. And this overturned a sort of probably quite popular idea that you might be happier if I gave you $10 compared to $1. In fact, it would depend what you were expecting. So he found that there was an equation that could predict how happy someone would feel as a result of receiving a little bit of money and that a key ingredient of that equation was how surprising that amount of money was based on what they were expecting. So I think this shows us that this ability of our brains to learn from positive and negative things in the world, engender expectations about what happened next, is clearly critical to moment by moment fluctuations in our mood. But also, I think, in our general sense of well-being. And I want to bring you back to a much broader idea of what expectations are to tell you about that. So I began by talking about pleasure. But in fact, I also think counterpart of pleasure, pain, is crucial to mental health. Some of this is obvious. If someone experiences something like chronic pain, of course that will worsen their mental health. It is horrendous to experience chronic pain. But maybe less obviously, the opposite is also true. People who experience poor mental health, so for example, episodes of depression, are more likely to later on develop a chronic pain disorder. This means either that there must be some kind of neural vulnerability in people with depression to developing chronic pain, or perhaps that there is some kind of overlap in how the two syndromes are, are engendered in the brain. And I think that's there's a little bit of both that's true. So chronic pain is not the same to the brain as acute pain. Acute pain is like if you stub your toe. If you stub your toe, there is this heavy peripheral input. It's called nociception through the spinal cord into the brain, and then you experience pain. Even then, it's filtered by various processes in the pain uh, in, in the brain. Are you paying attention to the thing that just happened? Are you escaping from a predator? Then it might get filtered out. But in the context of chronic pain, the filter becomes much, much more important. And this filter itself looks a lot like biologically what we see in the brains of people with depression. So someone experiencing chronic pain has changes in attentional regions in the brain, in regions involved in emotion processing, in regions involved in learning about good and bad things in the world, the same sorts of networks that we see disrupted in people with depression and some other mental health conditions. So I think this means that while, of course, the experience of chronic pain is not identical to depression, actually what it can tell us about our brain's sense of its own health, mental health and physical health, is actually very overlapping 
I even in the book use quite a personal experience. So I'm someone who suffered from chronic pain for a long time. And in my early 20s, it became really bad. And so I thought I had to have surgery again. This is on my foot. And I went to see a surgeon and he said, look, Camilla, we'll try one last ditch attempt. Why don't you try a steroid injection, which is a way of like decreasing peripheral inflammation. Um, and so I was like, sure, whatever, let's try it. And it was really effective, which I was very lucky. Some people, some people, it's not effective at all. But what I was probably even luckier to experience was that this injection, which was years ago, has, it's never, the pain has never quite returned to what it was before the injection. And that's probably not an effect of the steroids, which tend to wear off in about six months. Instead, I think what I experienced was a disruption of these chronic pain networks in the brain, a change in their expectation, monitoring attention towards this painful input, which in turn changed my actual bodily experience. You might be thinking to yourselves, this sounds kind of like a placebo effect, and that's because it is. The placebo effects get a really bad rap, but they're actually a critical part of even some of our most effective treatments. Pain drugs like opioids work partly via their effects on opioid systems directly, but partly via the placebo effect. The reason we know that is that if people don't know that they're getting an opioid drug, it doesn't work quite as well. It still works a bit. So they need the placebo effect to have their full clinical efficacy. And this is the case for a lot of similar interventions. So the message I want to get across there is that your expectations can become entrenched through these learning processes over time. This can affect your sense of mental health or indeed your sense of physical health in some cases. And that means that they can also be a sort of unexpected, treatable source. There are many cases of people being successfully treated for chronic pain, pain coming from a, a measurable physical cause that you can see on an MRI scan like, me, like mine, except they're treated with a psychological treatment, something like cognitive behavioral therapy. Why would that work? Because your experience of pain is filtered through, sometimes even hugely contributed to, via ongoing processes in the brain, which are targetable with many different things, but among them, psychological therapy. I also want to mention in this context, the role of psychedelic therapies, which you've probably heard almost too much about recently, so I won't belabor the point, they're in the news all the time. Very interesting new class of drugs for mental health. They have some things in common with other treatments for mental health, some things a little bit different, but Two things I will say. One is that they seem to work in quite a different way than our existing pharmacological interventions, something like antidepressants, which we know take weeks to work, probably via small changes in your perception of the world, something you might think of as a bottom-up change to your mood. Um, in contrast, a single dose of psychedelic drugs can in some people cause radical changes in their mood. And this would imply perhaps a, a, a more immediate changing of those beliefs about the world. You might think, why do that with psychedelics if therapy also does that? And I would agree. I think, well, I would agree with the, uh, the sort of hypothesis there that they both affect perhaps similar similar mechanisms, similar approaches to weakening, to changing expectations about the world. Of course, therapy can take a long time and doesn't work for some people, but ultimately, whenever you read a psychedelic trial next time, have a look to see if they did some therapy at the same time, and they probably did. So the two in tandem may in fact be more powerful than even something as sort of powerful as a psychedelic drug on its own. And the second thing I'll say about it is that whilst they do seem to have quite profound effects for some people, it's not entirely clear how much of that is down to the placebo effect itself. There's a really great paper um, that I read called Tripping on Nothing that shows that the majority of people told who were told they're being given a novel psychedelic drug 
the majority experience psychedelic-like symptoms, even from completely benign sugar pill. Some of them are more dramatic than others, but some of them are pretty dramatic psychedelic symptoms entirely caused by expectations. Um, and in psychedelic drug studies, expectations are really tough to control for because people to a certain degree can tell if they've taken a psychedelic before, whether or not they are currently taking a psychedelic. And that's not something you often see in studies. So that's just sort of something to be aware of about that new class of drugs coming up. The very final sort of critical ingredient of mental health that I want to talk about that touches on all the other things I've mentioned, but is really in and of itself an important message to get across are the interactions between the body and our sense of mental health. So everything I've mentioned until now is not separate from the body. Of course, we can all think of many pleasurable things that involve the body. We can also think of many painful things that involve the body. And crucially, many of these expectations that learning processes engender affect our sense of the body as well as our sense of the world. But the opposite is also true. Ongoing processes happening inside your body are having another peripheral effect on your sense of the world around you. In an amazing study done by my collaborators, Sarah Garfinkel and Hugo Critchley, now a number of years ago, they showed that the beating of your heart directly affects the emotions you perceive in the world around you. Somehow, your heart is gating your emotional experience such that when you see something emotional and it's timed to coincide with your heartbeat, you're more likely to label that as something fearful than when it's timed in between your heartbeats, when you're less likely to experience it as something fearful. Similarly, a common experience in anxiety disorders is a coupling between respiratory symptoms, things happening in the lungs and your experience of anxiety, even when the very things happening in your lungs might not have anxiety related origins. You might be going for a run or you might be breathless for another reason and that can evoke anxiety and panic-like symptoms. And then just to name, you know, perhaps my favorite organ at the moment in my lab and the work we're doing, the stomach also influences our emotional experience in the world. A study I did a few years ago gave people a drug. It was an anti-nausea drug that changes electrical signals from the stomach. It changes the electrical signals from a kind of, it's called dysrhythmia, dysrhythmia which you get when you're nauseous, into a more normal gastric rhythm, which is like a very slow electrical rhythm. And what we found was that when we made people's stomachs feel less nauseous, their brains were less likely to avoid disgusting images. So they were less likely to have that kind of normal disgust response, meaning there must be a contribution of these stomach signals um, into our experience of disgust somehow. So I think this shows that there are a number of sort of surprising peripheral roots into emotion. And the final one I'll give you, perhaps the best established one for mental health conditions, I would say, is the inflammation example. So throughout our body, not localized to a specific organ, we have various immune cells functioning to fight infection, but also probably other things in the body. And these markers of inflammation seem to have a profound effect on our mental health. You might've experienced, I don't know, feeling blue when you have a cold, but you also might've experienced, for example, feeling a little bit down after certain vaccines. This is a very common effect and in many ways proves the sort of causal link between the two, not just that people with mental health conditions have heightened inflammation, which you could see for many reasons, perhaps they're environmental causes, perhaps they're changing their behavior, which is affecting inflammation. But in fact, if you give volunteers a, a vaccine that increases that levels of inflammation, you will see short-term changes in the brain and sometimes in people's emotions that correspond to mood and, and mental health related changes. This can be quite profound. There are some um, you know, very, very severe treatments, for example, for hepatitis, where a number of patients can develop 
a, a major depressive episode from the treatment, which increases levels of inflammation. So it's sort of an important side effect to be aware of, but also a demonstration of the principle that at least for some people, increasing inflammation can cause mental health, mental health like sometimes symptoms. And um, so I think together, these three ideas reinforce the idea that a distinction between mental and physical health is nebulous and ultimately a little bit unhelpful, that in fact, biological explanations are important even for phenomena we think have clear social causes, at least in part, and also that because of the myriad of roots into poor mental health, which might differ between symptoms and certainly can differ between people, we need no no longer should we look at a one size fixed all fixes all approach to mental health. We need a much more nuanced approach to measuring and in future treating mental health symptoms. I envisage a mapping that would happen in the context of, of diagnosis, maybe alongside diagnosis, to understand underlying causal mechanisms, whether that's through a blood test to measure inflammation, but also through more cognitive and psychological tests to measure how someone learns about the world. And then treatments that can tie into those very mechanisms. Now, I haven't talked too much about the breadth of treatments available, but I think an important message, and really one that I spent half the book getting across, is that we have very many, very effective existing treatments for mental health. Do I think we can do better? Of course. But I think even with our existing treatments, to better understand them means to better treat people by mapping the right person onto the right treatment. Take something like exercise. Exercise maybe in some cases is a little bit underused as a treatment. It's a very effective treatment for conditions like depression, but it's almost certainly not going to help every single person with depression. In fact, for some people, the right treatment very well might be one class of antidepressants or another. And I think this message means that we need to dive into differences between people at the level of the biology to really improve our ability to treat, not just discover one amazing new treatment, which I hope happens too, but actually discover these links between people, between their experiences and the treatments that we have, as well as the ones that we'll discover going forward. So there are many routes into poor mental health. But in my view, and the message in my book, is that there are also many routes out. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And so now we will move to our question portion of this. So one of the questions in the chat asks, can you have psychedelics on top of SSRIs? Uh, so yeah. Um. Actually, this is a little bit of a, a incredibly hot topic question because I believe there is data either about to come out or has just come out showing that they can be combined safely and effectively. But in most cases, this is not something that's done clinically, often for concerns about side effects, but also just concerns about efficacy. So if you look at the major trials, they exclude people taking SSRIs. But my understanding is that some of the more recent trials are including them. So this may be something that we see shifting in the next year or two. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, so our next question. Do you have any thoughts on the influence of modern technology use, you know, computers, social media, stuff like that on mental health? You know, for example, this person asks how excessive screen time might affect someone's learning or pleasure response or affect top down processing of peripheral stimuli. Yeah, I think that's a, a great and extremely relevant question. So one thing I would say is that sometimes the way that policymakers, but also us researchers, have approached that question is to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, actually, nothing that we know about previous origins of mental health applies. We need to look at this as a totally separate thing, somehow influencing or worsening mental health. And I do think that approach is misguided. I don't actually think there's anything that special 
about technology or social media, except sometimes in, in volume or in type, but it's not like we learn completely differently by these, um, by these techniques than by others. I think they actually have more in common than they do differently. So instead, I think what we have to look at is what we already know about things that really negatively affect mental health, for example, bullying, and then just consider them in an entire context, a kind of virtual as well as a real life context. So that's a good segue into this next question. So what are the big unknowns in this area? What needs more research right now? Mm, great question. So one thing that is something that I'll give you an answer about my own personal research trajectory, but then also I'll, I'll think more generally, less selfishly. So one thing that started really Oh, piquing my curiosity while I was writing the book. So it's not in the book. It's become a major direction in my lab, though, is an interaction between our metabolic health, our metabolic system, and our mental health. So why would this be interesting? Well, we already know there's a really clear comorbidity, co-occurrence of diabetes and depression. And people have always had kind of simplistic explanations for that to do with, you know, maybe people are sad and so they eat a lot, like really, really not, not helpful scientifically or actually socially. But instead, I think there's a growing body of literature showing that there are common mechanisms in our biology and in our brains that could predispose someone to both poor mental health and poor metabolic health and maybe even provide new clues for kind of common preventions, maybe even common treatments. So an interesting example, just to kind of pique your interest, is that we have this sort of co-localization of insulin receptors and dopamine receptors in the brain. So actually the neural activities of insulin, which are metabolically controlled, interact crucially with these same variables contributing to mental health like dopamine receptors. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. Um, and so our next question asks, do brain scans provide us useful information on mental health, mental illness, things like that, that we could potentially use in research? Um, how does that contribute? I think brain scans provide very useful information, but we have to understand their limitations as well. So in my book, I talk about what brain scans sort of can and cannot tell us about mental health. Um, and I give the example of if you gave someone a brain scan and they were, um, and you found that every time they experienced something that improved their mental health, they lit up in particular areas. And I shouldn't really say it so simply because actually the steps between giving someone a brain scan and anything lighting up is just layers upon layers on layers of statistics. But even then, let's say you found that result, that result was kind of, you you believed it, it was, it was verifiable, replicable. Even then, you don't know that those areas are causing that experience. They could be part of a wider network, but actually nothing to do specifically with that experience of mental health. So we also need other types of experiments to sort of prove that causal link. Experiments with things like brain stimulation, also in my view, some types of animal experiments, experiments with drugs that change activity in those areas. So that's where I see fMRI as sort of, um, and other types of brain scanning as one really important piece of the puzzle, but not as the explain all or the cure all. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so that brings us to, I would say, probably our last question, but it's a good one. So you talk about the feedback loop between inflammation and bodily sensations and mental health. Um, could you speak to the ways that social interactions or the lack thereof might play into mental health? Um, you know, potentially like chronic social pain, like loneliness, how that could dissuade someone at making these attempts for connections and things like that because of the feedback. That's really interesting. So there's some beautiful work on loneliness in humans and animals showing that there's quite a kind of core link between loneliness and the same sort of survival signals in the brain that are important for, for, for eating, for thirst. So I think that this need for social interaction is probably computed by very similar mechanisms to other survival instincts in the brain. And for that reason, disruptions to it can have quite profound effects on your mental health. And with respect to inflammation, well, I actually think there's an even more interesting link there 
because interacting with other people is important at the level of sort of the immediate cognitive interactions. And, and that's probably what you were thinking about. And I absolutely agree with you there. But it's also important, actually, physically, when you're in someone's proximity, you end up having various physical things about yourself changed. And that can change your levels of inflammation. So I once heard John Cryan, who's a, a world expert on the microbiome, give a really compelling talk where he said, you know, if you're sitting next to someone, you might be doing some microbiome exchange right now. So I think, you know, we're still really trying to understand how things like the microbiome in, impact mental health. But we do know that physical proximity with another individual, it's providing sort of social connection. It's also potentially providing biological inputs to your body. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you again for a wonderful talk. Thank you all for coming. Um, once again, the link to purchase her book is in the chat. And we really appreciate this. Thank you all. And if, yeah, have a nice day. And Thank you all so much. Yeah, good night. Yeah. Bye.